Hey everybody, thanks for joining me today, Dr. Ross Marcagiani with another great talk at Toronto Health and Wellness Center. Today we're going to be talking about gluten. We're going to talk about what is gluten, the difference between celiac disease, gluten allergy, gluten sensitivity. We talk about the effects of gluten and its connection to autoimmune conditions, how we test for gluten, and then what are those sneaky sources of gluten we should be aware of, and what are our gluten-free grains. Let's dive in. So first, I know this is a pretty uh, well-known topic, but I'm still amazed the patients that come in uh, and, and that aren't really concerned with gluten exposure and aren't concerned that they don't have an overt reaction. So we're going to talk about that and why gluten might not necessarily demonstrate from a digestive issue or a gastrointestinal presentation. So we'll, we'll address that. But first, what is gluten? So gluten is the protein component in most grains. The big ones being wheat, barley, rye, but we'll talk about that. Um, really, how gluten got its name and how it became such an issue, or, um, or ch how it changed, was around the 1940s to 1950s, when there was a, um, an agriculturist by the name of Norman Borlaug. And so first, no, no, Dr. Borlaug was doing a very good thing. He was trying to increase crop and yield to be able to feed more mouths. So he's trying to solve world hunger. But in doing so, he created, he completely changed the structure of what we now know as wheat and various, uh, various sources of gluten, changed the structure and changed um, how we look at it completely turned it into what we now know as semi-dwarf wheat. So what that he basically did is he hybridized, he took, he took various strains of grain and basically played Frankenstein with the grains, hybridized them and deaminated them. So what hybridization means is that he took a protein component from one grain and then uh, mixed it with another and then kind of took certain genes out of the grain or proteins out of the grain, added other, others and to make a grain that was um, easier to, to, to create a larger yield. But in doing so, the grain required, required much higher levels of nitrogen, much higher levels of herbicides and pesticides. And now to the point where we played kind of uh, God with these grains to the point where some of these grains and corns now produce their own pesticide and some of them are even resistant to glyphosate which uh, some conventional farmers will spray on their crops which is a uh, very neuro uh, neuro reactive so that's the big thing uh, why people ask why there's been such a change in the grain and why is gluten coming up in the last you know 20 years because we're it's finally catching up to us of us playing science with these grains and hybridizing them and deaminating them. Deamination de de just means what they've done is they've added uh, acidity or they've added an enzyme to the grain to just make it more soluble with other food-like products. That's why gluten gets its stretchy, as you can see here, its stretchy elastic component is, because, is due to the deamination. And this has a lot of uh, side effects or cr cross reactivity with the brain, which we'll talk about. So what's the difference between sensitivity, allergy, and celiac disease? So that's kind of the more common one known is celiac disease. Celiac disease is when we're, we are having a, it's diagnosed by a intestinal biopsy. And typically you can have, uh, the first thing is looked at is we look at uh, tissue transglutaminases, which we'll talk about here at the end. Uh, you can also look at genetic testing such as HLA, HLA DQ2, HLA DQ8, which is genetic testing to show your uh, predisposition to gluten sensitivity or uh, and one indication is celiac disease. But the gold standard is con considered a tissue biopsy. And what they'll do is they'll take a tissue biopsy and we, they'll look at a couple things. They'll look at the structure of the microvilli, if there's microvilli atrophy. They'll see if there's basically, so that means like 
the finger-like projections, they're now blunted, what I call it, what I tell my patients, it's like looking at the grass. We want the grass nice and long. Typically what happens with um, allergies and sensitivities uh, is that the grass now looks cut, so there's no like finger-like projection to help with absorption and mycelization of food, the, the absorption and breakdown of food. They also look at what's called crip hyperplasia, so like in between, in between the, the microvilli are little uh, pits and imagine them looking like a, a bomb hit the, the, the pits. So they're much larger, there's, you know, pathogens can get in there and invade them and, and we can have more intestinal permeability. Um, also, we looked at, they look at the lamina propria, which is a mucus layer that attaches to the epithelial layer of the stomach, uh, which helps to prevent pathogens from invading and see the damage of that. But the importance of this to realize is there's, when they do, they do the biopsy, there's three measurements, there's three marsh levels is what, what they're looking at. They're looking at marsh type one, type two, and type three. Type three is the most severe, but there's been clinical evidence shown that you can have celiac disease or have, have t marsh type one, type two, and not have overt digestive issues or digestive complaints. Uh, typically, if you're a marsh type three, there's uh, there's very there, there's very strong evidence with always having some type of digestive complaint. But I thought that was pretty uh, surprising that you could fall into a type one or type two in the marsh scale and still not have overt digestive complaints. Also, so celiac. Uh, or gluten allergy is uh, us having a response to a certain immunoglobulin, an IgE response, which creates uh, anaphylaxis. That's like if we get stung by a bee or if you have a peanut, your throat kind of swells up, that anaphylactic shock. You can have that same response if you have a, a gluten allergy, an IgE allergy. And then we get into gluten sensitivity. So this is when we have a piece of gluten and we actually, re our new response, system responds by producing an IgA, IgM, or IgG uh, antibody. And I really like this picture here because it shows uh, as that, that villus, that grass, that, the grass of the finger, uh, the, the, the blade of grass here in our digestive tract that helps absorb, digest, and assimilate our, our nutrients and also re it releases some, some enzymes to help digestion. Uh, you can see here that as we proceed down the phase of uh, digestive impairment or, or micro, microvilli atrophy, that this atrophy also starts to produce gram-negative bacteria. So it actually starts to produce dysbiosis and create bad bacteria as well. And then as we can see here, when we get towards the later stages of microvilli blunting and uh, crypt hyperplasia, that we actually can have foods invade through the digestive lining. So that's a really important aspect here is that we can still have an immune response, an IgA, IgM, or IgG response without digestive issues, without having uh, overt digestive complaints. So gluten and autoimmunity. So this is another connection without having overt digestive complaints is what happens is, uh, I like the sunburn analogy. So when we initially get that sunburn, we can have that irritating, sensitive feeling. But after a couple days, that sunburn goes away, right? But your skin is still red and it's still inflamed, it's still trying to heal. That's kind of what happens when we have our, our exposure to gluten. At first, we notice that there's a little bit of, of inflammation and irritation, but after a while that inflammation or that heat goes away, but we're still having that red discolored um, uh, presentation. And that kind of just continues as we continue with our, with our gluten exposure that we never really get that redness to go away, but we might not uh, notice the overt heat from the, from the reaction. But this is kind of how autoimmunity progresses here. So what happens is we have that initial inflammation, we have that initial response from gluten. And what happens is as we continue this response, again, and we just talked about how we keep eating it, we never get that color to return to normal. We keep eating it and we start to again, damage or blunt the microvilli. 
as we start to blunt and damage that microvilli, we start to have decreased absorption of our nutrients because the grass isn't long enough to absorb those nutrients. Then we start damaging the lamina propria, we start creating more crip hyperplasia, we start damaging that barrier that is between our gut and our bloodstream. So now we have foods that start entering into the bloodstream, we start uh, increasing what's called tri tissue transglutaminase, which is, uh, which is created in response to consuming gluten. And now that tissue is able to get into our bloodstream and that has a lot of cross reactivity. So we're gonna talk about cross reactivity. That means that we can consume a food such as gluten or we can release a food, uh, an, an enzyme or something that's in the digestive tract into the bloodstream and it can have cross reactivity. It can look like similar aspects in the body. In this example, when we consume gluten or, uh, or we have exposure to tissue transglutaminase in the body, it can look very similar to synapsin, it can look very similar to something called a GAD, a GAD 65. It can look something very similar to your cerebellum. And all of these aspects, so the GAD 65 in your cerebellum have a lot to do with balance, coordination, ataxia, which is like tremors or essential, non-essential tremors or kinetic tremors. Your cerebellum, um, your synapsin is a protein in every neuron. So we can have a lot of neurological complaints. So with gluten, uh, what people have noticed and what research has noticed that the majority of people with gluten sensitivity don't don't exhibit all the time digestive complaints. A lot of the times they notice first neurological issues such as brain fog, such as non-essential or essential tremors, such as excessive anxiety, over compulsive disorder, depression. A lot of these neurological issues present first. Also joint issues, also thyroid issues start to present with this exposure to gluten. So if we're just going off digestive complaints solely for our, for our react, if we have a reactivity to gluten, we're missing the mark. Then we also have molecular mimicry. That's when uh, Hashimoto's or rheumatoid arthritis starts to creep into the picture, another autoimmune condition, because as these food particles again get into that bloodstream, the immune system has a hard time deciphering, is that a piece of food particle? or is that a piece of joint or thyroid tissue? They look awfully similar, so the body says, I'm not gonna take a chance, I'm just gonna kill both of them. And then that's when we have increased risk uh, to autoimmunity. And then we talked about briefly the activation of autoimmune markers such as tissue transglutaminase is now getting into the bloodstream and its connection with other aspects of the body that uh, start to increase the, the likeliness of developing certain autoimmunities. So what kind of testing do we want to do here for, uh, for gluten, either gluten, gluten sensitivity or gluten allergy? So you can do a simple uh, IgE test for a gluten allergy. You can do, like we talked about, your HLA gene testing or get a biopsy done uh, for celiac disease. But for your sensitivity, uh, Cyrex Array 3 is, does a really, really good job. Uh, it runs over 32 markers that look at gluten sensitivity, it looks at your IgG, IgM, and IgA response. Some other uh, standard lab tests that we can run, we can look at your deaminated gliadin antibodies, we can look at endomesial antibodies, we can look at what we talked about earlier, tissue, tran tissue transglutaminase body, uh, antibodies, we can look at your IgA. These are aspects, again, these antibodies that are circulating, they create that cross-reactivity which will attack other aspects of your body or that molecular mimicry where they kind of look similar to other structures in your body. So some sneaky sources of gluten here. So we wanna make sure we try to avoid, obviously our wheat, our spelt, rye, barley, modified food starch, looking on the back of the label, looking for food emulsifiers, artificial food colorings, Staying away from malts, syrups, your dextrins, bulgur, cereal binders, uh, and condiments. You want to make sure they're labeled gluten-free. Any beer, 
deli meats, trying to make sure they uh, are nitrate free and that, you, that they are labeled gluten free. Salad dressings are another common sneaky source and soy sauce if, it, if I didn't mention that. Uh, gluten free grains that were, are pretty safe, your amaranth, your arrowroot, beans, flowers, buckwheat, corn, as you can see corn and oats here are, have an asterisk next to them because they have a similar proteome or they have a similar genetic structure that looks somewhat similar to gluten. So if you notice with oats and corn, you're having some of those symptoms come back up, you're safer just to remove that, that, uh, that food. Uh, others, potato flours, pea flour, quinoa, sorghum, tea flour, teff, uh, tapioca, uh, nut flour, hominy, rice flour, uh, mesquite flour. So as you can see, there's a lot of sources outside of wheat, barley, rye, and your generic uh, gluten-containing foods to have a sufficient, adequate diet without, uh, without consuming gluten. So that's the real important part. So the two drive homes today, we can have gluten exposure with, and we can have gluten sensitivity without overt digestive complaints. It can manifest through the brain, the nervous system, the thyroid, and the joint. And that we can live a very appetizing uh, lifestyle with non-gluten containing grains. I appreciate your time. Please don't forget to share this with like-minded people. We're all in this together and my goal is to be able to give you information to make informed decisions on your health. Thank you for your time and have a great day.